In this video we want to talk about buyer motives and in particular the psychological factors that underpin the buyer behaviour and the decision to purchase. Now there are other videos that relate to buyer motives and in this one we're going to deal with the psychological factors but as you can see from this diagram it uh, also applies to personal influences and social influences and they're the subject matter of separate videos but in the current video we're going to look at uh, ideas related to perception, motives, learning, personality and see how important these are in helping to explain buyer behaviour and the, the buyer motives. Now the bottom part of this slide looks at the decision making process starting with problem recognition and that's where the buying decision truly starts. It starts when we we have a need, we have a want and we recognize the want and from there we go into search, we search for a solution to satisfy the want or, or the need and we go to evaluating alternatives and making a purchase and then reflecting on the purchase and evaluating the purchase. So that is the process that we undertake. We, we may do it so fast and uh, we don't recognize the various steps or sometimes it may be just impulsive buying we we go to a shop and see something and buy it um, but perhaps you could say that the processes are still there except we've gone through the processes extra fast but what we want to do here in this video is to look more in more detail I should say at the psychological influences so psychological uh, factors influence individuals' behaviours. Uh, psychological factors are what resides in our head. These are the, the, the faculties that create the demand in the first place and create the desire to perhaps possess the product. But they're also the factors uh, within our heads that evaluate the, the whole process and evaluate whether the purchase decision should be positive or negative, whether we should make the purchase or not and clearly psychological factors are a major impact on buying behaviour. Uh, we can identify various factors that uh, fall under the psychological heading uh, perception, motives, learning, attitudes, uh, personality. Now we're going to go through these in more detail over the, the rest of this video we're going to look at each of these and, and have a few words about them, have a few slides about them and, and talk about them. But the psychological factor or factors we have to recognize are complex and there are many, if you like, sub-influences that help to determine our position within the, the buying framework, whether we should make the purchase or not. There are many factors, it's not just uh, one psychological factor. There are many influences that we need to take into account. Let's go through uh, these various headings and this will uh, make up the rest of this particular video. So we'll start with perception. Uh, individuals have their own set of principles, values and norms which helps helps them to make sense of the world. We We, we are complex creatures. We have sets of ideas in our heads and we have values and things we believe in and what we believe to be right and wrong and the various principles that we've got and or don't have. Um, and these help us to make sense of the world. This is how we analyze the world. This is how we, we see the world. We see it through what we we have as our, if you like, our psychological predispositions. This is our this is the framework through which we see the world. Perceptions are personal to each individual and are governed by individual experiences, emotions and personalities. So we are different. We have different influences which help to make us up. Um, there's a big debate in psychology about what is it that makes us. Is it nature, what we've inherited from our parents and our grandparents? 
Is that is that where we get our personality, or is it nurture? Is what we've experienced over the course of our lifetime, our education, our background, our friends, the events that have happened to us. What is it that goes to make us up? And there's a big debate as to whether we are more nature and less nurture, or the other way around. But what we can say is that we tend to be different. We tend to have different views, different ways of analysing situations, different backgrounds. So we, we do tend to have different different stances in relationship to different situations. Likewise, we're going to have a different stance in terms of the buying decision, whether we should buy something or not. No two individuals will respond in, respond in the same manner to a situation, generally speaking. We, we tend to have... If for nothing, no other reason, we have just nuances of differences. We have just slight differences. We could still end up making the same purchase, but we, some of us will feel more intense about the purchase. Others will feel they've made the purchase, but it was marginal. So individuals analyse, interpret and organise information in different ways in order to make sense of situations. Customers also perceive marketing information in different ways. This is dependent, uh, this is dependent on the, the current situation and the individual needs. So when we see marketing information, we, we don't all approach the marketing information from the same direction. We, we absorb the information, we analyze it, we think about it. Some of us reject it, some of us think it's not effective, some of us are interested in it, some of us are amazed by it. So we have a whole range of emotional responses to the marketing message that companies put out. For example, if someone is hungry, they're more likely to be attracted by a McDonald's marketing advertisement than if they have just eaten a heavy meal. So that's just a simple example. A simple example of how effective marketing can be. Marketing needs to be appropriate. It needs to be in the time and place. Uh, it needs to have a message which is is, is resonant. It, 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 it makes an effect on the person and it addresses a need that the person has at that moment in time. An individual is more likely to absorb marketing information during their free time than a short lunch break. You know, during a free time we're more relaxed, we can look at the the marketing information, we can absorb it more, we can replay it perhaps, if it's a video we can replay it or if it's uh, an advertisement on television we can think about the last time we saw it and we can also associate advertisements with happy times in our lives and that'll create something positive in our mind. Or we may look at the advertisement and it may remind us of something bad that's happened to us in the past. Because at the time something bad was happening, that advertisement was playing. It's not the fault of the marketing people, it just so happens. That's the way we see the world. But during a short break, say at work, we don't have the time to absorb marketing messages as such. We're too caught up in the moment. We're trying to relax. We're trying to recover from the last bout of work and prepare for the next session of work. So we're not too keen on absorbing marketing information. We take in information in different ways as individuals. Um, there are three perceptual processes an individual goes through. We have selective attention, we have selective perception and we also have selective retention. Let's have a few words about each of these. First of all, selective attention. Individuals do not focus on every piece of marketing information. By and large, we don't concentrate on all of the marketing information. We, we just select what we want. We Parts of it will, will appeal to us, perhaps. Other parts of it we, re we don't even take in. We don't think about. We're being selective. 
we filter out irrelevant marketing information and only focus on information according to needs and preferences. What is it about the message, the marketing message, that affects us directly? What is it that appeals to us? Not all of the message, just that part of the message which we can relate to. So we're being selective. Customers who do not watch football, for example, will be least interested in marketing advertisements focused on football. Because we're not interested, let's say, in football, so advertisements relating to football don't interest us. Uh, people who are not interested in golf will not be impressed by advertisements played during golfing matches on television. They don't, they don't matter to us. We've been selective. Marketing advertisements and promotions are designed with visual image, images and text to attract customer attention. So the marketing personnel and the advertising personnel must be very careful to know what the message should be and how the message should be presented so as to maximize the impact of the marketing message. But they must also bear in mind that the recipients, the potential customers, will be select selectively attentive. They will pay some attention to some parts of the message and let other parts just go over their heads. They're not going to think about it. Selective perception. Well, an individual's personal feelings and beliefs about a brand can influence the way they interpret information. Uh, this can have all sorts of directions uh, involved. It could be someone bought the product, a friend perhaps bought the product, and had a bad experience and told somebody else and and this is going to influence the way other people see the product. Or it could be um, someone thinks that the product is not very fashionable and not very desirable and this may influence people's decisions. So how we interpret information may be a function of feelings and beliefs and these feelings and beliefs may, may be derived from others or they may be, may be self-generated. It may be that the person, uh, him or herself, just simply does not like the look of the product or uh, doesn't like something about the company. A person who holds negative feelings about a brand will perceive marketing material as negative. If somebody doesn't like the particular brand then they won't like the advertisements, no matter how how good the marketing material or the advertisements are. No matter how clever the marketing people are, people will not like it. They don't like the brand, so they will not like anything about the company, the chances are. Information will be manipulated and distorted in order to make the information consistent to their views about the brand. People will look at the information, the marketing information that's made available or perhaps the advertisements on television or in the press. They will look at these and they will still interpret what they see negatively because that's what they believe about the brand. So they are selective in their perception of the marketing information. Marketing information can be misinterpreted or twisted. This has a negative impact on the organization. Marketing information may be misinterpreted. It may be misinterpreted sometimes deliberately because people simply don't like the company or don't like something about the company, don't like the owner of the company or don't like what the company did 10 years ago in some market or, or they didn't like a product in the past. Whatever reason, uh, they may simply have a negative view of the business and they are being selective. They have selective perception. There's also selective retention. Customers do not absorb every piece of information. They tend to remember information that's favorable uh, 
are of a relevance to them. They, they, they look at the information that's put out and they only select some of that information because that's relevant to them. They don't, a lot of it, they, they just ignore. They're being selective. There's a lot of information coming out about a new product, perhaps, coming onto the market. People will look at the information and say, this applies to me, I will remember this, this is, this is relevant. All the rest of it is not relevant. They're being selective. They have selective retention. Marketing adverts, um, advertisements, always repeat on television, the radio, on the billboards in order to ensure customers absorb maximum information regarding marketing campaigns. So repetitive advertising may be used to try and push across a wider message, a bigger message, that the product is desirable. And maybe that's the reason why we have repetitive advertising, to try and reinforce the, the message, reinforce what was being put across. Customers are more likely to remember brand and product benefits uh, of their favourite brands and discard other brands that offer similar or better benefits or value. Uh, sometimes people have almost an emotional connection to a particular brand. They've always bought it. Their family have always bought it. Uh, therefore, they are loyal to the particular brand. So when they, they see other brands being advertised, they reject the other brands. They, they don't even think about it. They discard the information. They, they, there's a barrier. They, they don't want it. They know what brand they want. They've always had it. So again, they are being selective. And they're only retaining what they want to retain. Motives. Well, individuals have certain motives behind making a purchase decision. The motives can be very wide, simply giving them, as an economist would say, giving them utility, giving them satisfaction or pleasure, so to purchase a product. But they may be doing this for a wide variety of reasons. Image, um, consumption, uh, all sorts of reasons behind it. Motives are needs or wants which compel customers to make a purchase. That's what motives are. These are the needs or the wants that drive the purchase decision. Customers have different needs and wants. This makes it difficult to predict customer behaviour. So customers are not homogeneous. They're not all the same. Customers vary. Uh, they vary because of psychological factors, but they also vary because of the circumstances they find themselves in. And as I said earlier, that's the, the subject matter of a separate video. But they, uh, they have wants, they have needs, and if the product is seen as fulfilling those wants and needs, then they may pay more attention to it. But one customer will have a different intensity of want or need to the next, so people vary. Motives are difficult to measure as they are subconscious, subconscious and are, they're also difficult to identify. So what is it that makes people want something? And it's very difficult to determine precisely what that is. Maslow's hierarchy of needs identifies a set of needs and an individual's capacity in satisfying those needs. Uh, it's a very straightforward exercise. Uh, Abraham Maslow, a very famous psychologist, American psychologist, uh, put forward this idea. It's uh, well established in the management literature it's a bit like a pyramid building up from very basic requirements up to very high order uh, requirements at the top of the pyramid. Um, an individual will feel the need to purchase a drink if he or she is thirsty. He or she is satisfying a basic need. That's, that's fundamental. Food, thirst, shelter, these things we need, these things are 
vital for us. So they're at the very base of our purchase decision making process. These are what we have to buy, we have to consider. But if we could go up to something luxurious at the top. Now here it's, uh, well do we buy it or do we not buy it? Customers will satisfy needs through uh, the need for house protection insurance, health care insurance, customer protection legislation and aftercare services for protection uh, protection against electronic items failures and so customers will satisfy all sorts of needs ranging from basic needs getting uh, food shelter and so on and then they'll go into buying the next layer up and then they move from there to buying protection for those items insurance and health care and so on and then they move up to buying something a bit more luxurious and until finally, as I said, we get to the top of the Maslow uh, Pyramid. Marketers have influenced and manipulated customers uh, on the basis of satisfying uh, the needs for love and belonging. Uh, this is, it's, it's very similar to McClellan's uh, need for affiliation. We want to belong, we want to be liked, and marketers try to relate this need we've got to their products and say if you purchase this product people will like you. Whether they do or not is debatable. But adver advertisements regarding uh, say deodorants, toothpaste, mouthwash, they, all, they imply that bad breath can deter potential relationships. So they are dismissing something bad. If you, if you don't have these products people will not want to know you. So they're playing on on this fear. They're playing on the fact that you will not be a member of the group. You will not be uh, a person that people will want to know. You will not be a belong to the club. These types of advertisements play with emotions as people do not want to be lonely. They, they want to be a part of society. They want to be accepted. So it's playing with fear. Examples include washing up liquid, breakfast cereal, uh, food implies happy families. So what we have is uh, we have cosmetic products which make us more appealing to, to mix with but we also have uh, the fact that we include modern products and we are fitting in with the rest of society. We are, uh, we are desirable people to know because we are not, we're not primitive in inverted commas. We are not, we are not harking back to a bygone age just for the sake of it. We are using uh, modern ways of living and we are fitting in with group norms. And the group norms themselves are probably determined by repetitive advertising over many years which have brought, if you like, society into uh, some sort of norm, some way of living. So breakfast cereal, for example, is well accepted. Uh, as as a, a way of starting the day, but perhaps 200 years ago, it was different. We also have esteem needs. These are driven through the need for status and respect. Brands represent a status and indicate luxury and elegance, and we have that. We we want to show off. We want to say we have bought a particular product because we have a particular status in society. We want, we want people to admire what we have. We want people to admire us and, and be envious of us almost. So we have brands which are luxurious. Esteem needs are pressured through job prospects. A career choice influences the status and the brand that customers pur uh, purchase. So as we move up through uh, various jobs and have better standards of living, we might buy more expensive products. Um, 
And these products are used to signal the rest of the world our status and the fact that we are successful. Self-actualization uh, is difficult to measure and implies uh, and sorry and implement as this is individual and personal. Self-actualization means different things to different people. It could be raising a family that, that gives a deep sense of feeling to a person who feels happy because they have achieved uh, what they wanted to achieve in terms of a family unit. But it could also be the chief executive officer of a company who has now achieved his or her position and they've always wanted to be a CEO and now they've achieved it so they're self-actualized. And that's the idea of the Maslow uh, hierarchy of needs ranging from the the very basic needs of satisfying food and shelter and so on at the very bottom through the safety needs getting insurance and trying to make sure that the future will uh, will continue happily and, and the, they can build on what they've got social needs recognized by colleagues and having friends and and having products which enable them to fit in with the society esteem needs having luxurious items that indicate how successful they are up to self-actualization. Now let's look at learning. Well learning is an important element in the purchase decision making. An individual learning, um, knowledge, experience all determine purchase choices and as they make the need behind making these purchase decisions um, learning is is what enables a person to evaluate products to evaluate their own needs and enables them to have a correspondence between the product and their need in other words should they buy this product and if they buy it will it address the need that they have got is it a good purchase and the way they they know that is through learning. Learning occurs through knowledge and experience which then leads to interaction. Learning changes individuals behaviors. Uh, the individual behavior is modified as they learn more, as they have more experience and they reflect more on their their previous experiences and they learn more, they become more cognitive, more understanding, more more analytical as well as looking at their experiences from the past and reflecting on their experiences from the past. So decisions become more sophisticated as time passes. A positive or negative learned experience will determine how an individual reacts. So experiences can be negative or they could be positive. People may have had good experiences in the past or very negative experiences in the past and these will determine their approach to a product in the future. For example if a customer purchases soya milk and dislikes the taste resulting in a negative experience the learned behavior will assume uh, not to purchase soya milk in the future. However someone else may purchase soya milk and love it and think it's wonderful and the mere mention of soya milk will in future make lead to a sale they'll want to go and purchase some more and and have it because they think it's wonderful so it depends what was their experience the principle of advertising relies on learned behavior for example TV advertisements are repeated regularly to maximize learning opportunity customers are more likely to respond if they remember an advertisement and the product features. So repetitive advertising is it, it, it almost inculcates the message, it, it deeply ingrains the message in the, the mind of the, the viewer or of the reader if it's an advertisement in a magazine they come across it on a regular basis they become impressed by that advertisement and 
in future when they think of a product the chances are they will associate it with the one that they have had most exposure to. So they are in a sense learning about products and about what products claim and linking that to their own needs. Now personality. Well personality plays a key role in a customer's purchase choices and preferences. Personality determines an individual's internal traits, qualities and behaviour. Personality is what makes people unique. Um, we have personalities and the personalities are the products of perhaps back to nature and nurture, what we've inherited from our family or what we have learned over the years, the people we've mixed with and the experiences we've had, all start to form our personality. And our personalities, because we've had such a wide range of experiences and different family backgrounds and so on, we have different personalities. So we have both internal characteristics which are inherited and external experiences. That's the nature and the nurture debate I've been talking about. A customer's personality influences the type of products they purchase, the brand preferences, social activities and hobbies. So personality is very important. Somebody who's outward going will require different products to somebody who prefers to stay at home. Someone who likes foreign holidays will like different products to people who like domestic holidays and so on and so on. So personality is very important as a determinant of the purchase decision. Marketers use personality factors to advertise and promote products and services which appeal to certain personalities. So marketers try to determine in relationship to the product they're promoting what sort of personality will be most interested in that product and then try to target that, that personality group because that will optimize on the marketing expenditure. It'll give the biggest return. For example, advertisements represent characteristics such as gregariousness, friendliness if you like, independence and competitiveness. Certain advertisements include um, alcoholic beverages, cigarettes in the past, cigarettes was no longer advertised, cars, clothing and computer games. So if they're advertising alcoholic beverage they want to show people having a good time laughing and joking and being friendly. Uh, if it's computer games they might want to show competitiveness and how good they are at computer games. So to try to work out the personality types and try to link those to the products they're promoting. So, we've now looked at buyer motives from a psychological perspective. We've seen it's, it is very complicated and there are many factors to take into account. Nonetheless, it's important and it should be noted. But that's all I'm going to deal with in this session. I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you for watching.